How's it, how's it, how's it? Good morning, everybody. Good to see your faces today. Glad to have you at Metro. If you're new, my name is Brandon. I'm a pastor here. Uh, hey, can we give a hand to the 23 people that got baptized yesterday? Isn't that a great thing? Great job. Great job. So excited for that. You know what's cool about that is that uh, some of them are, are right here in this service. We're excited to see how God has moved your heart to making a faith decision and stepping forward with him. And what's awesome about this is we had people across generations, across different backgrounds, whether they've been in church before or never at all, uh, seeing God move to the point where they said, I believe in Jesus and I'm not afraid to tell the world. I'm going to step into obedience, into the waters to be cleansed. I've already been saved because of what Jesus did, but I'm not afraid to tell the world, hey, I believe in Christ. He's my Savior. So we're so excited about that. Would you thank them one more time and congratulate them? Great job, guys. So happy for you guys. This next step, what you're doing. I was reading this study on churches across our country, and it was pretty disheartening to see various statistics. One of them was that X amount percent of churches haven't baptized anyone in the last year. That broke my heart because that means that they're not reaching out or they're not seeing people come to faith or step into those faith decisions. And that was very disheartening to see what is happening uh, in churches across our country. It may be even more grateful for our church or a safe place for people to explore faith to ask different questions, to hear different perspectives on faith and come to a decision of Jesus is the one. I'm going to put my faith in him. That's the kind of church that we want to do, that we want to have here of growing in spiritual formation and then putting that into action, into mission. So we have that many things going on. We're excited about that. And then it was a really fun Ohana day where we just hang out as a family. Uh, we had shave ice. That was a lot of fun. Kids played. I forgot to put on sunscreen, so my face is all uh, crusty right now. Uh, you know when you go like this in a mirror? And the lines don't go away after. I mean, that's just age, but still, yeah, yeah. Man, I got sunburned. Anyways, hey, one of the ladies that got baptized yesterday uh, is, is a good friend of ours. And it was really cool. She came to our preschool. Her daughter came through. Through that process, they came to know more about Jesus. And then she got baptized yesterday. We wanted to show you her story. Take a look at Trisha's testimony. I'm here with Trisha. She just got baptized today. Trisha, we're so proud. Maybe describe what was the step that you took to get baptized? First of all, go to church. <laughs> go to church, make friends. The whole church community in general um, is basically what got me to take my first steps. Um, I actually think I went backwards knowing that I did baptism last because I joined like Rooted, I joined um, Growth Group, and I joined Story of God. Yeah. So I just feel all those steps led me to be here and to finally get baptized. How do you feel like the journey to this point was? It was a great journey. Um, it's still a journey, you know, it never ends. I feel that every day I was learning, but overall I feel good about it. I feel great. I feel like a whole new person, honestly. What was it like to be out there being baptized today? I was nervous. I was cold, not like cold feet, but it was actually more um, slight anxiety. But knowing that I've been waiting for this and I've been praying for this, that I felt confident about it. So how do you feel now after being baptized? I feel great. Um, like I said, it's not a journey that ends. It's still ongoing. I'm still learning. But I do feel more confident knowing that I have Jesus. I have God with me. And I can confidently speak about my experience. You know, I want to tell my friends and my family, uh, tell everybody, you know, that this is something I chose to do in my time. For me personally, it was my time and I felt that after today's experience, it was so emotional only because there was just so much flashbacks of my life that I felt needed to be renewed or I needed to, you know, know that the burden is off my shoulders because walking through that water, coming back from after getting baptized is where I was more emotional. Seeing my family and my friends, it's like at the finish line, sort of, when you run a marathon. I feel, I feel renewed. I feel like a new person, and I feel like it's a whole new life now. Well, praise Jesus for all he's doing in your life. Amen. 
Yeah, and we look forward um, to many more baptisms. Keep praying for you and all that God is doing in your life. Yay! Yay! <laughs>
It's kind of the same thing as LA Disney. There's like a couple of other f- small, different rides, Beauty and the Beast. But if I want to see Beauty and the Beast, I'll just hang out with Kali, get plenty of beasts and beauty. Like. <laughs> but did you know that Mickey Mouse is the same in LA, Florida, and Tokyo? Just his eyes a little bit smaller in Tokyo, that's it. Like, I saw Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mickey Mouse the same, LA, Florida, Tokyo, same thing. Anyways, that was good fun. Went to Tokyo, Disney C, D, E, F, all of them. And then um, here's the last picture. We went down to Meguro River and saw the cherry blossoms. Just want to let you know this picture is, uh, is really fake because none of the lights were on and they weren't pink. In fact, I was Googling nighttime sakura, like see. So we went different places and we showed up and all the lights were off. We were like, because the, the blossoms came later. So all the lights they set up, they took it down when it was time to take it down, but the flowers weren't out yet. So we went, the flowers were out, but no lights. So someone took our picture, and I was like, well, might as well take a picture. So I took a picture, and then I looked at it, I was like, whoa, where'd all these colors come from? Because you can hit edit and hit that magic wand thing and like, bink, right? I'm like, whoa, and it makes it look like everything is pink, and maybe it's just Kara's jacket, I don't know. And I thought, you know, isn't that like the Lord, where we have these, these uh, like, kind of bummer moments, like, oh, and the Lord goes, okay, hold on, just watch. Watch what I do. That's, that's where we're going with this whole thing. We're, we're going to be in this, this whole time together about things that we experience, and we're, we can go through highs and lows, like expectation, disappointments, but we just watch what God does. If you're new to church, can I just say this to you? I didn't say this in the last service, but just let me just speak to you. If you're, if you're new to church, give it a shot. Give it an honest shot. There's going to be some Sundays that don't jive with you. I, I've been there where you're like, eh, but give it, a, give it a good try because you're going to see God almost hit, the, hit the, the magic wand edit photo button and just bring color to areas of your life that you didn't even know existed. But you got to give it a good shake. Give it a good try. So if you're new to church, try us out a couple of times and see if this is what God is doing. And if not us, there's a bunch of other churches in our area that we know and love that are awesome. But we believe that it's the same Jesus at these other churches, just like Mickey Mouse, same Jesus, um, yes, I compared Jesus to Mickey Mouse, forgive me, Father, but <laughs> that is going to show you amazing things and color will come into your life in ways that you never thought. That's what this series that we're going to get into is about. As we're on the plane coming up into the sky, um, le- actually, let me take a step back. We're going to start a new series called Let Faith Rise. Last week, during, um, after worship, we call it ministry time. I felt like the Lord just moved my heart in this direction, that this is where he wants to take us as a church. I had this whole thing planned last week for what I was going to say instead. And also, I had the next sermons all planned out about, we're going to talk about this topic. And last week, God just grabbed my heart and said, nope, I want you to go this way. I want to take your church family this way. I want want to emphasize in your church this aspect of let faith rise. So we're going to take that sermon series that we're going to do and shelve it. We're going to put it on the back shelf. And we're going to say, we're going to focus on how does faith rise in our church? Why? Because I think, um, like me, many of us here are getting some victories and some defeats. We're getting some good things and some tough things. I've told you what's happening in my family with my mother's health, things that we're going through as we're looking and holding on to faith and saying, God, what are you doing? Because I believe and yet I have doubts. I, I, I trust you and yet there's times that I'm so frustrated that I act in ways that really are unbecoming of someone who believes in Jesus. Anybody else? Not just me, right? Thank you. Okay. So how do we see faith rise? That's what we're going to be focusing on. Because it's not just talking the talk. It's how do we actually apply it to real life, the nitty gritty, not the pretty, but the hard stuff that's difficult. And that's where faith is going to rise. So... If you are with us last week, you heard like almost a snippet of what God was kind of brewing and, 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 and stirring the pot on. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be focusing on this question. How does faith rise in our church? How do we see that happen, not just corporately, but as your family? And then you as an individual have a part to play in seeing faith rise. And if you want to see that happen, then stay tuned because that's what we're doing. Well, we get on the plane and... You know it's tough when the pilot says on the taxi to the runway, well, we're going to get going soon, and um, we're expecting some turbulence. When you hit turbulence and you're in the sky, you're like, oh, we weren't expecting that. It's not that bad. It's like, you're like, oh, that was fun. (laughs) Okay. But when you're expecting turbulence, you're getting some, and on the jump, right off the takeoff, um, my kids are looking at me like, and I'm like, it's going to be okay. We do this kind of stuff, and it's fine. And as the plane is ascending, we get there, and sure enough, as we get up to cruising altitude, we hit a couple of turbulent spots, and I'm like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, yeah, this this, this is, it's going to be okay. 
my kids are looking at me, not just on takeoff, but now during tournaments, like, is this okay? Because there's some pockets where you kind of drop a little bit in your seat, you know? And it makes your heart go, ooh. It's like a free roller coaster you didn't pay for. Actually, you paid for it, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> my son falls asleep in my lap, and I'm holding onto my ginger ale as I'm like, don't spill it on his head. And I'm thinking, this is kind of like life, isn't it? You hit pockets of turbulence, some that you foresee because they announce it, and some that you don't even see coming. And it shakes you to the point where you go, are we going to be okay? And I think now applying that, uh, that idea, now applying it to life, I, I, I think there's this funny aspect of letting faith rise where God is asking us, would you trust me even when things are not smooth sailing? Would you trust me even when things get a little bit shaky or a little bit shaky? Will you lean into me? Would you trust me with this? Isn't it interesting that we will entrust our entire lives when we step onto an airplane to a person we've never met sitting in the front of the cockpit, a pilot and a co-pilot whose hands we've never shaken, eyes we've never looked into, they don't even know our names outside of a flight manifest, that we'll entrust our entire lives to someone who neither knows us and, and, I mean, outside of doing their job, doesn't really care about us personally. But we'll step onto this plane and risk literally our entire lives and our family's lives if we travel with family. And yet we have a hard time trusting the living God who we can't see. I'll trust God when I can see him. You've never seen the pilot, but you've seen what he does. And yet we won't trust our lives to the living God who knows our name, who cares about us deeply and personally, who knows how many hairs are on our head or hairs that used to be on our head and is involved in the intricacies of our life. When Jesus says, your heavenly Father knows what you need before you even ask, he wasn't making hyperbole. He was saying, your God knows you. How can we not trust this God that knows us? Remember back in the day where the pilot would stand at the front of the airplane and shake everybody's hand? Those days are gone. Maybe that's like your faith. Maybe you came to faith in Christ a while ago and Jesus was real to you. You shook his hand, metaphorically speaking, but now you're not even sure if he's there. I'm here to tell you today God wants faith to rise. God wants faith to rise in your heart. God wants to grow and increase in your trust and confidence in him. Can we trust the living God who gave his life for us sacrificially that he might take us to places that we've never been? Through the tough stuff, through the good stuff, I think we can. And this series that we're walking into is going to be a time where we're going to be challenging ourselves as a church, as families, as individuals. Because no one owns your faith but you. Only you can own your own faith. And because of that, God is challenging you and me to take steps forward. God doesn't want us to have low levels of faith. No more normal airplanes will take off and then ascend and get up to cruising altitude. And then at bing, 30,000 feet, you can take up your seatbelts, you can access your stuff, you can do whatever you need to do. God wants us up there. And yet some of us are content with just getting off the ground. Some of us are content with just getting off the takeoff and cruising at 100 feet. Going, at least I'm off the ground. At least I'm here in church. You know how many people don't even go to church anymore? At least I'm going to church. At least I believe in God. You know how many people don't even believe in God anymore? At least I'm... All true. There's a lot of people that don't believe in God or go to church anymore. All true. It's good that you're online listening to the podcast. It's good that you're here in person. This is a good thing. But do not be content flying at a thousand feet when you were designed to fly at 30,000 feet. Do not be content even getting up to like 10,000 feet. Well, at least I'm higher than those chumps. No, 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 no. God doesn't grade on a curve. God is asking us to rise higher. And he wants faith to rise in this room. He wants faith to rise in your heart. He wants your confidence to be in him. Instead of comparing our spiritual walks to other people, he wants to take us to places that we've never been and help you to function in the way that he's actually made you to. Faith must rise. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. God wants to challenge you and I to let our faith rise. Why? Because I'm telling you, if you stay at low levels of faith, you'll be like, yeah, God is good, but yeah, I guess it's okay. I guess, I guess I've seen God do some good things, but... And you'll never see the miracles, the beauty, the majesty, the wonder, being captivated by the eternal things that God is actually placing in this world, that God is actually designed for people who are willing to rise with him. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. 
The other day, uh, my wife and I overly ambitiously decided to climb Coco Head. Now, if you're not familiar and why people are laughing, Coco Head is a horrible hike. Hike. It's not even a hike. It's a thousand, it's a, Coco Head is a staircase in a desert. And it's out in the Hawaii Kai side of the island, and the kids were in school. We said, you know what we haven't done in a while? We haven't climbed Cocoa Head. Let's go do Cocoa Head. So we took the kids to school. We drove out there. We parked the car. I said, remember when we used to do this in our, tw- our 20s and 30s, and our friends would go, and we'd go up Cocoa Head, and we'd look at the sunrise, or we'd cruise and take a cute selfie, and then go eat breakfast at Moana Cafe, and all that. Well, let's go do that again. So we parked the car, she and I, get our, our shoes, to lace our shoes up. We walk up from the parking lot to the trailhead, beginning of the stairs, I was already out of breath. (laughs) I said, why are we doing this? Because it's fun. Okay. So we start walking up. It's a thousand stairs, basically. So we start hiking up the first, hey, this ain't bad. Still got it. Still got it. Walking up the stairs. At about a hundred stairs up, I'm already out of breath. We're taking our first break at one of those yellow bricks that are painted on the side. About 100, 200 stairs up, I'm like, I'm good. Let's go eat breakfast. I hear Eggs Benedict calling my name. Turn around, look at the view. Here's the view from about 100 or 200 stairs up. Take a look. This is, this is the view. Okay, you see down at the bottom of the railroad track thing, the white thing, that's the beginning of the trail. <laughs> so we've not gone very far. But look at the ocean. You have an ocean view. It's beautiful. Look at that. I could post that and be like, hashtag hiking, <laughs> hashtag cocoa heads awesome, hashtag cocoa nuts, like you could put all this stuff. And it would be a decent view, like it's not bad. We could very much and very well say, we did it, we did cocoa head, and go home. But everybody knows that's, that's not it. That's not the end of the trail. That's not where God asks us to stay. So we kept going, and we kept going, and we kept stopping and stopping and stopping. <laughs> We took a lot of breaks. Okay, just 20 stairs and then take a break, okay? There's a thousand stairs. Just, it took us 45 minutes to get to the top. No lie, a lady wearing a full gown dress walked up past us. It was like holoku season, just. No lie, had some grandmas that looked like they were from the Kupuna ministry walking past us. Konnichiwa. Oh my goodness, we are so out of shape. And when my quads started reminding me that I've never worked out in a long time, when, when, when my hammy started going, hey, and my calves started mooing, I was like, I'm done. And we finally got to the top. We got to the top and this feeling of accomplishment, we didn't die, washed over us. And we sat there and went, I'm really glad we kept going. Because here's the view from the top. There's Hanama Bay. There's Diamond Head, the backside of Diamond Head. There's all of Mauna Lua Bay. That's the view from what's supposed, where it's designed to look like. You follow me on this, right? You could very well stay at low-lying, 100 foot on the hike, 1,000 feet in the airplane. You could very well stay at low levels of faith. At least I believe in God. And you know what? how many miracles you'll see? Oof, not as many as the top. You know how much blessing you'll see in your life? You'll see some. Oh, but the view is so much better from the top. Doesn't it hurt? Doesn't, I mean, I don't want to hike up the mountain. It's a beautiful dance of the grace of God and us being willing to partner with him. Yes, to do the things, to read your Bible, to pray, to, to trust, to surrender. It's a beautiful dance of the grace of God and, and the, the amazing things that only God can do. And then the hand of God working with obedient hearts. Is it all my effort to work my way to the top? No, it's not. Because you can never er earn or work your way into not only God's pleasures and glory and majesty, but even to every other thing. There's a lot of grace involved in this. What a beautiful dance of the two. I liken it to a waltz where one person has to lead. So who's going to lead? You? No, let it be God. Would you follow him in the spiritual dance as he leads us forward? Would you let faith rise? Do not be content. Do not, look, I'm talking to somebody. Do not be content with staying at low levels of faith. What a waste of time. 
hoping that this low level of faith will be your eternal get out of hell free card and that's all I'm doing it for. What a waste of time. When God has invited you to enjoy so much more of life, do not be content with living down here. When God has made you to live up here, let faith rise. And it starts by your heart being willing and open. Consider this, to go where God wants to take us, we need to let faith rise. To go where God wants to take your family, we need to let faith rise. To be the man or woman God has made you, designed you, called you to be, we need to let faith rise. All of us are familiar with seeing someone else, whether we're related to them or not, whether we know them from work or whatever it is, all of, us are real, all of us are familiar to this concept of knowing someone else that has such untapped potential, and we're like, oh, if you would only just, because you see what they could be. Did you know your heavenly Father sees you in a similar light at times? And out of love, not condemnation, he says, let me help you. Let me work with you. Let faith rise. And that's what this series is going to be about. To go where God wants to take us, we need to let faith rise. So what is faith and how do we grow in it? Well, we were in Luke 17. We will be there later. Uh, keep your finger there. We're going to go to Hebrews 11 to make sure we define this in the right way. Hebrews 11 is on page 1212 in the House Bible. This is our, our primary definition of faith. When we say let faith rise, what are we talking about? What, so if we can define it, then at least we can get a good handle on how we take this thing forward, right? Hebrews 10 is all about suffering uh, through the difficult stuff, holding on to hope in the midst of despair. Hebrews 10 is about God disciplining us because he loves us as sons and daughters. And in light of that, let's hold on to faith. Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2. Church, let's read this out loud together. Even you in the Ohana room, let's read this out loud together. Ready? Go. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. What do we mean by let faith rise? Would your confidence in God and his goodness, would your confidence in God and his overall plan with your confidence in God's ability to work with you through the difficulty you're facing, rise. Would you grow in confidence of what God is doing? We want to be a church where we don't just say change by Jesus to live like Jesus. We want to be a church where people's faith can grow, to have the space to expand, to believe, to trust. This word confidence is what are you assured about? Do you have that person in your life who is like always on time? Like whenever there's a thing, they're always on time, like so much so that it's like annoying. Like party starts at 6 and they're at your door at 6. You're like, what are you doing here? You said party starts at 6. We're still cleaning the living room. Come in. You can help us clean. Do you have that person in your life who's like always not on time, like always on Hawaiian time, which is like always late? You know, that kind of, you know anybody like that that you know? Like they're just consistently that way. You have confidence that if I say the party is at 6, that this person's on time. And I have confidence that person's not on time. Listen to this. If faith is a confidence, an assurance, what we hope for, we do not see, to let faith rise means would we have confidence that God is going to be who he said he's going to be. He's going to be faithful to his word. He's going to follow through on his promises. He's going to be with us when we feel like we're, we're at wit's end. We're alone in this thing. He's going to see us through even when our current evidences around us don't feel like it that he's going to walk with us. Would you grow in that confidence? How? Well, first look at what he's done before. Our confidence comes from seeing someone's previous track record. And then our confidence increases when we see continuous evidence in future things. To see faith rise in this church, in your life, in my family, in your family, to see faith rise is to say, how do we believe that God is going to come through? Second thing is this, your level of faith can grow. Your level of faith can grow. Somebody say amen to that. Just like any workout, muscle, anything like that, the more that you exercise it, the more that it grows. Your faith can, you are not designed to stay at Sunday school levels of faith. You are not designed to stay at low level, introductory, rudimentary, elementary levels of faith. 
God has created you in such a way to rise with him, to keep hiking up the hill, to believe him that you're not made to stay at 10,000, but rather 30,000 foot levels of faith. Your faith can grow. How do we know that? Because even the disciples that walked with Jesus and saw his miracles firsthand, they turned to Jesus at various parts of the Gospels and said, increase our faith. Go back to Luke 17. Even the disciples who saw what Jesus had done, they saw the miracles. Jesus taught this hard thing in Luke 17. He says, hey, you got to forgive people even when they wrong you. How many times? Two? Seven. Seven? Actually, 70 times seven. And they're like, no can. No ways. Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on you again. Like they say all this stuff. Jesus said, no, no, no. You're going to forgive people even when they wrong you. And then they said, increase our faith because it's so hard to do. And then Jesus says, as we had read, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you say to this tree, go over there. It'll go. How, what does that mean? It means that God wants our faith to grow. Jesus wants to increase our faith. The good news is your faith can grow, not to stay stagnant, not to just come into believing in God and then leave that as par for the course. No, God wants you to grow spiritually. Listen, why is this so important? Well, two reasons. The first one is, if our faith will grow, then we'll show the world who Jesus is. The more our faith grows, the more that we show who the reality of Christ. You know how I came to know Jesus? It was in high school at a Young Life event. Because I saw other people my age having fun about Jesus stuff. I was like, is this stuff actually fun? Because I grew up going to church and it was boring. And then later, I saw my dad come to faith in Christ. And it changed his whole life. And everybody on the outside was like, yeah, give this time. This will pass too, like another fad. But it didn't pass. In fact, it didn't pass so long. He became a pastor. It became such a life-changing thing for him that people were like, is this for real? And because his faith grew, it impacted me. What does that mean for you? As your faith grows, you're going to impact people around you. People are looking for the reality of Jesus by the people who call themselves Christians. And if you're tired of being a Sunday Christian and then Monday through Saturday just living like whatevers, let your faith rise. Believe that Christ can take you higher. But you've got to choose that. Our vision statement, changed by Jesus to live like Jesus. You know how you're going to live like Jesus? By letting your faith rise. So let me ask you, let's take a faith inventory, shall we? Let, let's, let's take an assessment. Where are you now? So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and it's meant for you to evaluate yourself. Use whatever scale you want. Yes, no, pass, fail, one through ten, one through a million. I don't care. Just look inside of you. Can we do that? Now, sometimes the best way to do that is by closing our eyes. So if you want to close your eyes, I ask you these questions. I invite you to do that now. Let's take a faith inventory. How's your level of trust in God? Would you say that you trust him? Or would you say, eh, not really? How's your spiritual disciplines? How's your Bible reading? When's the last time you actually opened up your Bible? How's your prayer life? Do you pray at all? When you pray, is it the same prayer before meals, before bed? Or is there intentionality in what you're praying? What are you hoping for? Is God involved in that? Or is that just all you? Who are you praying for on their behalf? Who are you contending for? How are you showing them Jesus by the way that you treat them? Who are you reaching for Christ intentionally? Who are you discipling? Are you intentionally discipling anyone by showing them Jesus? Okay, open your eyes. These questions are not exhaustive. They're meant to just say, where are you at? And if you answered yes or got 100 or a 10 or a million on all these questions, can you come preach next Sunday? Because I'm wrestling with all this stuff too. I'm dealing with questions about where's my faith at? 
See, here's the thing. I want to see our church become a church where people are able to become disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Disciples who disciple others. Because no sense you grow and learn all this stuff and it's just for me and I'm all good. I've heard one person say, the church is full of fat Christians, not here, but rather we're so full spiritually, but we don't give it out to anybody else. We just think, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. Okay, who are you feeding? Nobody, just for me. That is not the heart of this church. Where we're taking this church is to be a church that makes disciples who make disciples. And whether you've been a Christian for a long time or not, I want to see our church be a place. God is calling our church to be a place where disciples actually are able to make other disciples. Somebody say amen to that. Otherwise, all we're doing is feeding ourselves. And if we're going to be changed by Jesus to live like Jesus, it's going to take us increasing in our faith, desiring to go higher and not going, well, at least I'm in church and not at the beach. Come on. You are made for more than that. You are made for more than that. You are designed to rise higher. God wants us to grow in spiritual maturity. Formation and mission, that's the words on our wall. God has made us that we would be formed spiritually even more and not be satisfied with being babies spiritually. What is spiritual maturity like? It's it's meat, not milk. Spiritual maturity is meat, not milk. The Bible says so. You know, when a baby is young, you feed them milk or formula or a bottle, whatever it is, and when they get older, you feed them spam. No, not, you know, don't, do, don't do that to them later. But you don't just feed elementary, basic stuff. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 says, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you weren't ready for it yet. Indeed, you're still not ready. What an indictment against the Corinthian church. It's kind of like a, oh, they got to grow up. Hebrews 5, verse 11, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, see, disciples who make disciples, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish from good and evil. What an indictment against the church that the book of Hebrews is addressing. What an indictment against our church to be people who don't just satisfy ourselves on milk. Well, pastor, I love the sermons because they're meaty. That's not all this is talking about. This is not talking about sermons that are full of biblical insight knowledge that reference Hebrew and Greek and look at a Bible dictionary or a lexicon or get into all these things. It's not talking about just that. It's talking about in light of good preaching, in light of good things happening in our churches, how is that growing you to be someone who consumes not just spiritual milk, but meat? How are you growing spiritually? How do we let faith rise? It's time to grow. It's time to put the bottle on the side and say, God, what are you doing in me? And how can you use me to influence others? Hey, I agree. (laughs) Come on. So why should we desire more faith? Go back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 6. Go ahead and put this up on the wall. Church, we're reading this out loud. I want to hear every voice in this room. Here we go. Ready? Go. And without faith, It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. What is the one thing that pleases God? Faith. What is the one thing that pleases God? Say it with me. Faith. What is the one thing that pleases God? Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him because anybody who comes to him must kind of believe that he exists. And then he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know what doesn't please God? A beautiful singing voice, strong preaching, lots and lots of prayer over and over again. Those things are good. Faith. Faith pleases God. Jesus marveled at his disciples' lack of faith. And he was astounded by people who had no business having faith being filled with it. The Syrophoenician woman who asked Jesus to pray uh, to heal her child. And then she said, 
well, can you hear? And he said, no, it's only for the children of Israel. He said, no, 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 even the dogs eat the scraps that fall off the table. And he marveled at her faith. At the centurion who came to Jesus asking to heal his servant. And Jesus said, okay, I'll make my way there. And he said, no, no, just say the word. Because I too am a man under orders. And if you say the word, just like with me, it'll happen. I believe. And <laughs> Jesus goes, your faith is amazing. Jesus marveled at faith. Would he marvel at yours? Why does faith please God? Because it's your confidence in him and his power. Here's the cool thing. When your faith grows, there's a promise attached to it. When your faith grows, the promise is he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because if you come to him, you've got to believe it exists, and you've got to believe that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So what's the reward? You go win the lottery. You can go Vegas and hit them big. What's the reward? The reward is not any of that earthly, worldly stuff in and of itself. Rather, here's the reward. When you grow in faith, here's the promise. The more faith you have, the more blessings you'll see. The more faith you have, the more miracles you'll see. Yes, I said miracles. The more miracles you'll see. The more faith you have, the more you'll resist temptation and walk in righteousness because God's grace is flowing through you. By the way, as a quick aside, did you know that most temptation is really a lack of faith. Because when we often give in to temptation, we're not believing that God can fulfill this desire that I'm looking to fill in ungodly ways. Many times, a lot of the times when we give in to temptation, it's because we're giving into things that we think will bring us all of this hope and healing and wholeness and make us feel really good about things when really it's not. We don't believe that God can actually fill this desire for fulfillment for community, for the antidote for my loneliness, for my depression, for all these other things that we fill our temptations in. Oftentimes, giving into temptation is a lack of faith. The more faith you have, the more hope you'll have in the hurting, the more confidence you'll have in uncertainty, the more contentment you'll have in the face of disappointing circumstances, the more purpose and drive forward you'll have in the face of setbacks. You, honestly, hand to God. The more faith you have, you'll have a better marriage. You'll have a better family. You will love your spouse, your parents, their parents, your children. You'll love them better. If you're single, the more faith you'll have, the more you'll be able to walk through into the season of life that God has placed in front of you. The more faith you have, the better it'll be. Write this down as our last point today. God rewards great faith. So would you let faith rise? Would you let faith rise in your life, in your family, in your heart? Oh, wait, I just flipped to the next page. There's way more points than that. That wasn't the last point. Sorry. <laughs> so faith is not hype. It's not emotions. It's not clapping and going, yeah. Those are nice things. They're not wrong. But faith is confidence. It's just quiet confidence of knowing that Jesus is faithful. God is with us. So why don't we let faith rise? Fear, doubt, disappointment. We're too comfortable. We don't want to risk. Why don't we let faith rise? Because we think this life is pretty good. God's around, but I got this. Pride. There's a lot of reasons we don't let faith rise. And that's why in Luke 17, when the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith, he replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea. It'll obey you. You know what that tells me? I heard a pastor say it like this. I thought it was so cool. How big is a mustard seed? Super small. If you're not familiar, it's tiny. And Jesus was saying, if you want to increase your faith, just realize you only need this much. You don't need this much or this much or this much. So maybe it's not the size of your faith. It's what you do with it. Maybe it's not the amount, truckloads, boatloads, dump trucks of faith. Maybe it's not the amount of faith. It's what you do with that faith. So would you give that to God? You don't need a rice cooker full of faith, let alone a musubi. You need one grain of rice of faith, and that's it. You know what that means? You've already got it. If you believe that God can, you've already got it. So what are you going to do with it? Would you give that to the Lord? So how do we do so? The first thing is surrender. How do we give this faith to the Lord? Surrender it to God. 
The video you saw of baptism is people surrendering their lives, saying, I believe, I'm not afraid, I'm going to tell the world. Surrender to the Lord. If you want to let faith rise, give this issue, this thing that you're dealing with, surrender it to God. I think some of us here are carrying something in our lives that we want to see faith rise, but we've got to choose to surrender it to God. Here's the second thing. If you want to see faith rise in your life, get out of the way. Sometimes we cloud and get in the way of what God is trying to do. His majesty, his glory is there. We want to see, I want to, I want to believe, I want to put my confidence in you. Sometimes we got to get out of the way. Let me tell it to you like this. We're in Japan. We're doing all this fun stuff. And I thought, I want to see Mount Fuji. It's like what Japan is known for, yeah? So we talked to two people who come to our church. And they're like, oh, we have the best tour that we recommend for you to take. All right, so they hooked us up with this tour company. And we got there. And we went there early in the morning to get on the bus. And they said, okay, the bus ride to Mount Fuji is an hour and a half. And there's no bathroom on the bus. And I looked at my five-year-old and I said, we got this, buddy. Don't worry. Sure enough, we were okay. And as we're driving out an hour and a half out of Tokyo, going towards the Mount Fuji area, I'm looking out the window going, oh, I never would have saw this part of Japan. But thank God we took this bus tour. That's cool. And I look towards Mount Fuji. I'm like, where's Mount Fuji? No worry. We'll see it as you get closer. The closer we got, the more I realized, oh, the weather's kind of bad today, kind of cloudy. So we pulled into the Mount Fuji Visitor Center, whatever it is. As we get into the Visitor Center, the guy on the thing, okay, uh, get back on the bus in, uh, we got 15 minutes, and uh, there's a viewing deck on the north side over here, so go up over there, you can take a look. Okay, so we get on the bus, we walk out. Still kind of cloudy, you think you're going to see anything? I don't know. We get out to the viewing deck. Can I see nothing? I'm like, oh man, we're out here. What are we gonna do? Okay, we gotta get back on the bus. Get on the bus. Hey, talk to my wife. You think we're gonna see the mountain or what? I don't know. And the guy, the, the tour guide goes, well, uh, little bit cloudy today. Uh, Mount Fuji kinda shy. So, why don't you pray to the deity that uh, Mount Fuji come back from vacation? Eh? I said, brother, I'm on vacation right now. I paid more than $100 a head to be on this stupid bus. <laughs> All I like to see is one mountain, okay? We're gonna go up to a viewing level four, see a better view. Okay, okay, sit down. And the, the bus goes on these switchbacks up to the, up the mountain, up the mountain, and it goes from cloudy to rainy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man. And we get to this viewing level four where it's just like, it's like Polynesian Cultural Center, like Diamond Head Lookout. Just choke tour buses all lined up. Our bus couldn't even park. So they pull over, they let us out. Can't see it. In fact, you, you like see. Okay, look, you watch this, watch this. Can anybody see Mount Fuji? No? Somewhere over there. Somewhere over there. So over there someplace. Get back on the bus. But I'm all hub. We what we say home. We say, I'm all hub boot, yeah? Or I'm hoo hoo. I'm all like. <sighs> My wife looked at me, she goes, hey, no hoo hoo, ah hoo. <laughs> no, she never said I just made that up. <laughs> but I'm all like, you gotta be kidding me. So if you're visiting Hawaii, I know what you feel when like you go whale watching, you'll see nothing. Or like. Anyways. We're driving down the mountain, switch back, and then we did some fun stuff. We rode a boat, we did the ropeway, and it's actually really cool. Just, I never saw Mount Fuji. And then we did baptism, and uh, Val and Kent got baptized, and they go, oh, we just got back from Japan yesterday. I said, how was it? They go, we saw Mount Fuji, it was beautiful. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care, baptize, blah, blah, okay. <laughs> And then I show up today, Pastor Russell, he's wearing one shirt with Mount Fuji on top. <laughs> and then I ate an apple this morning, honey crisp, not nah, Fuji, just kidding. No. Anyways, um, riding back on the bus, and I'm like, God, you gotta be kidding me, man. Like, we spent all this money, spent all this time, and I couldn't even see the Mount Fuji because it's dumb cloud. And then it's almost like, you know, when God, like, <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit goes, shut up. Be grateful. You're in Tokyo with your family. Oh, yeah. And the Lord reminded me, 
You know how many times people come to your church looking for me and all they see is people too busy to show God's love. All they see is, you know, this show. And I said, people are looking for a genuine reflection of me. You know how many times you, you go to your office or to Costco or to your classroom or you go to that, people are looking for, people are looking for hope. You know how many times, and now turning this from me to us, you know how many times we get in the way? Our insecurity gets in the way. We care too much about what they think about us. So then we're not showing God's glory. We're like, we're just clouding the glory of God. You know how many times our pride gets in the way? We're trying to act a certain way and it's more about us. And the majesty of the mountain is clouded because our hearts are so, bleh. you know how many times our fears get in the way that we don't show God's goodness or glory because our faith hasn't risen to the point where we can get the cloud out of the way. You don't want to see faith rise in this church? Number one, surrender. What's that part of your life? You need to give to God. Surrender that to God. Number two, would you just get out of the way? Would you identify what's that in your heart? Pride, insecurity, selfishness, temptation, a huge amount of disappointment and doubt, a fear of failure, being overly comfortable with this life and finding all your treasures here and forgetting about there. You want to see faith rise in this church? You and I got to choose to get out of the way. People are looking for the majesty and glory of God. You and I are looking for that. You got to get out of the way. You know how that starts? By acknowledging that something's in the way. Take a faith inventory. Where are you at? Do you trust God? Yeah. Do you want to trust Him more? Yeah. Then let's go. I want to see faith rise in me, in my family, in this church, in you, in your family. I want to see faith rise. And we're going to focus on that in this next series. I'm excited for it. So come and join us as we talk about this very thing. And let's see faith rise. Can you say amen to that? Stand with me. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we don't want to talk about it. We want to be about it. We don't want to just settle for low-level, introductory levels of faith. Some of us have been Christians for way too long, and we haven't talked about Jesus, shown Jesus, encouraged someone in Christ, discipled anyone in forever. Forgive us, Lord, for forgetting the great commission, not just of evangelism, but of discipleship. Forgive us, Lord for being deists and theists that believe in God, but don't put that into action. Help us, God, to surrender to you, to put what we believe into what we do, to put what the truth that we believe about you, your grace, your love, your goodness, to internalize that and to walk that out in our lives today. Thank you, Lord. If you're here this morning and you want to see faith rise in your heart, it starts with surrender. It starts with getting out of the way. And if the Holy Spirit has identified something you need to surrender or something that you need to identify to get out of the way, would you just give that to God right now? In fact, in this moment of prayer, if the, the Holy Spirit has identified something you need to surrender or to get out of the way so that faith would rise more in your life, would you lift up a hand to the Lord and say, God, that's me. I feel you prompting me. I feel you pulling me closer to you. And therefore, God, with my hands raised, I surrender this to you willfully. Thank you, Lord. God, I bless and pray for every person whose hand is raised to you, that you would help us not just to talk about it, but to be about it. Help us to take one more step forward with you. Help us to be someone who says, I want faith to rise in me. Thank you, Lord. And thank you, God, that you meet our prayers. Go ahead and put your hands down. It's because of that we speak your name. We thank you, Jesus. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Would you thank the Lord this morning? If you need prayer, our prayer team would love to pray with you as you consider what God's asking you to sacrifice. Let's finish like we always do. Let's sing the doxology together.